okay, it is time. It is time to marshal all of our knowledge, all of our calculus knowledge, all of our pre-calculus knowledge, to sketch some accurate graphs in maximal detail. So let's start off with this. Yeah, not something we're gonna know off the top of our head, but let's, uh, we, want, we wanna label all the intercepts, all the asymptotes, the relative extreme of the points of inflection and intervals of concavity. So let us start with the calculus stuff and take our first derivative. So we're gonna do the division rule? Yes, the quotient rule, low D high. High D low. Let's see. Times 2x. Can't go ahead and cancel the twos while we're here. That's all over. That squared. Yeah. Well, that X squared plus 2 squared. Can we move the squared side? Which removes that, yes. Cool. I'm going to break this part into some fractions. See, the first guy is. Square root of x plus 2 over x squared plus 2. That's going to be minus x all over root x squared plus 2. Did I get something like that, yes? Yeah. Now then, I have, my, I have the same denominators. So I can combine these fractions, but well, um, this is x squared, and uh, you guys sat on the numerator, is that supposed to be an x squared? The top, top, top. At the right. top? Yeah. Oh, yes! That was an x times an x, yes? Right. So that should have been an x squared. Now, I want to combine my numerators, which requires that both numerators have the same denominator. Denominator. So this guy I need to multiply by. Wait, don't they have the same denominator? Oh, more now, this is over one. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so I'm looking at denominator in the numerator. Right. Okay. So we're doing some uh, some relatively annoying algebra, but it's going to have some payoffs in terms of being able to graph this. Cool. Okay. So let's see. On the top, I have just x squared plus two. X squared plus two, then minus minus x squared. Minus x squared. That's going to be over. Oh, I swear that makes plus two. So just two over all of that. Yeah, two over all of that, and that's all over x squared plus two. x squared plus two. Fine. Which I'm going to write as x squared plus two of the first. Because if I rewrite the square root of x squared plus one as x squared plus, sorry, x squared plus two to the one half. One half? Then all of this right here, let's say the top, is just 2. And this comes out to be, when you multiply both sides by 1 over x squared plus 2. Is that 3 halves? Yeah. So this entire thing, which I'm going to go ahead and write here now, give me some space. 2 over x squared plus 2 over 3 halves. Yes. Exactly. Two over x squared plus two to the three halves. That is my nice first derivative. Neat. And likewise, I can do a similar sort of process to find the second derivative. But I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to go, go ahead and just tell you that when you do the second derivative, do that. Similar algebra, you get negative 6x all over x squared plus 2 to the 5x. Okay. So again, I'm not showing you those algebra steps because they're exactly analogous to what we did for the first derivative. Now then, I need to do my calculus stuff first, which means intervals of concavity, points of inflection, relative extrema, or at least critical numbers. Um, let's start from the top. Is this thing ever zero? Um, I believe so, when x is zero. It's zero when x is zero. Does x equaling zero correspond to a point on the original graph? Yeah. Is it defined at zero? Yes. I mean, this is defined actually. That's zero. Zero, zero, the origin. Yeah, uh, but the, the entire function is defined as a domain. 
Well, then, yeah, any number. Any number works. Yeah. How about, is this thing ever undefined? No. No, so what am I doing? What, what kind of number is x squared plus 2? It's always... It's always going to be positive. Positive? Then I, when I raise that to the fifth power, I get something that's... Positive. Positive? And then when I take the square root of that... It'll be positive. Positive. Yeah. So then I only have one possible point of inflection. One possible point of inflection. I was going to the first derivative for a second. Is this thing ever undefined? No. Now again, x squared plus 2 is always a positive number. Yeah. You cube that, it's always going to be a positive. You square root that cubed thing, it's still positive. So it's never going to be undefined. But by the same token, is this ever going to be 0? Is the first derivative ever going to be 0? Uh, no, it can't be. No, we just decided the bottom is always positive. Yeah. The top is always, always positive. So this thing is never... never zero or undefined. On the contrary, it's always what kind of number? Positive. It's always positive, I guess, so while we're here. So it's going to always be increasing. What's it, though? The derivative. Wait, it? The first derivative, the critical number, the slope is increasing. Uh, uh, the slope doesn't have to always be increasing. Right, the original. The original graph, yeah. F, plain old F. Yeah. Is always increasing. So, again, again if you want to emphasize that, F prime is always positive, which means F is always increasing. Yeah. And the slope doesn't have to be always increasing. I mean, look at this, look at this little piece here. Right? Yeah. If this is a piece of my graph F, it's always increasing. I always have a positive slope. Oh, but slope is decreasing. Slope is decreasing. Gotcha. So don't confuse those two. And so if it's always increasing, then there won't be any relative mins of max, right? What's it? Um, the graph won't have any relative mins of max if it's always increasing. Right? right. So we have no relative extrema. We know that already. Cool. And we also don't have a saddle point because so f prime is never zero undefined. And we'll, we'll get to that more in a, in a second. So let's see. I don't have any relative extrema, but I do have potential points of inflection. So let's go ahead and marshal this information. I'm going to take this number and do what to it? Um, put it back in the original equation. I'm going to use it exactly to split up my entire domain from my original to get some nice intervals of testing. Negative infinity to zero is one. And now this time I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to put you know zero to infinity, but for maximal detail, all being in one chart, I'm going to put the entire domain of my original function on this first row. Huh. So okay. I'm also going to put x equals zero. Okay. In the middle. So we got three separate regions corresponding to the entire domain of the function. And another different thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put all my functions. So why are you doing this exactly? To find like asymptotes or? I'm just, just to have all of our information in, nice, in one nice place. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm not worried about asymptotes right now. I'm just worrying about my calculus knowledge. Gotcha. Really, really, you can find asymptotes using calculus, but you can also find them using pre-cal yeah, techniques. Right. I'm worrying about the pre-cal stuff, the intercepts and the asymptotes. I'm going to worry about the pre-cal stuff at the end. Okay. For now, I'm going to look for relative extrema, points of inflection, and intervals of concavity. Which means I'm going to look at my second derivative. What's that doing? What's my first derivative doing? And what's my plain old function doing? What's its behavior, given those conditions? Let's start from the top with our second derivative. What is the second derivative on this interval? Um, you're going to have... Uh negative times a negative on the numerator, so it's going to be positive. Positive on the numerator? And then positive on the denominator. Right, we already decided that the denominator was always positive. Yeah. So always positive there. What's my first derivative doing on this interval? That's just going to be positive. Right. This is always, always positive. F prime is always positive everywhere. So you can just go ahead and put plus signs across the board. Yeah. 
pluses all across the board. Going back to this column, what is F doing in terms of concavity? It's uh, concave up. Concave up. And it's increasing. By way of this fact, yeah, and it's always. It's always increasing too. So. so this comes by way of this fact, and this comes by way of that. This fact. So it's increasing all across the board. Increasing well. all across the board. Um, now next column, what is uh, F double prime doing at x equals zero? Um, what is it equal? That just equals zero. It right? equals zero, right. We decided against the possible point of inflection, so of course it equals zero or undefined there. So zero, positive, we're done with that. Yeah. Those first two entries. Um, I'm going to leave this blank for a second, but this right here is increasing. Increasing, that comes by way of that second factor. What about from zero to positive infinity? What is the second derivative doing in terms of its sign? Well, if we put a positive number, then it's negative in the numerator. Negative so times a positive is a negative. Is a negative. I divide that by what kind of number? Positive. Positive. So overall, I have a negative value, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Negative, positive. Is this concave up or concave down? Concave down. Yes, the original is concave down. And of course, it's always increasing. So I am done with my intervals of concavity. So what about that? Concave up on this interval, concave down on that interval. Now what about points of inflection? Is that where that bullet point is supposed to be? That's where this bullet point is supposed to be. Is it or is it not a POI? So, I mean, the signs are changing, so it's yes. got to be, right? I compare what is it doing just to the left. It's going from positive to negative. Yes, concave up just to the left, concave down just to the right. And defined at zero, which is nice. Yeah, it's a point at zero. So this is indeed a point of inflection. Cool. So I'll just say A P O I. Well, we really at P O I at zero F of zero. Yeah. So what is zero F of zero? That's just the origin. Right. Zero F of zero is zero zero. That is my point of inflection. And with that, I am done. This and this. How about relative extrema? I mean, we said we couldn't find any because the first derivative is always positive. Right. right? If it's always positive, there are no relative extrema, yes? Yes. It's always increasing, there's no relative extrema. So we are done. With that, and with that, we are done with all of our calculus uh, knowledge. Cool. Our needed calculus knowledge. Quite, quite over, hopefully. All right, it's over. Now we need, well, you'd think that. Now we need to know the intercepts and the asymptotes. All right, let's start with the asymptotes. Let's start with the intercepts. Do we have an x-intercept? I mean, the origin counts, eh? Well, let's see here. For an x-intercept, you set what coordinate equal to zero? Y. Right. Y f of x, yeah. Y or f of x, y being zero, implies zero equals all this stuff. Yeah. That implies that x is? Zero. zero. X is zero. And the origin is both an x-intercept and a y-intercept, I guess. I mean, but we, we, I mean, sometimes we can have other intercepts, right. so we have to be a bit careful. So the y-intercept, so we know one inter x-intercept is 0, 0. And is there any other y-intercept? If it's a function, then no, because... Well, you know, we just need to set x equal to 0, so that'd just be 0 over the square root of 2, or which is 0. So y equals 0 over root 2, which is 0, so 0, 0. Functions as both the x-intercept and the y-intercept. Just the origin. So that takes care of my intercepts. Oh, finally, the asymptotes. Okay. Finally, the asymptotes. Let's 
let's see. Well, you are we doing a vertical fist or horizontal? Does it have any vertical asymptotes? I don't think it can be because the denominator is always positive. All right, the denominator. This denominator can never be zero. Right, yeah. So we don't have to worry about vertical asymptotes, but we do have to worry about what kind? The horizontal ones. The horizontal, exactly. Do some room here. Let's start with uh, going all the way out to the right. What is the limit as x approaches infinity? So I lied, we're not really done with our calculus stuff. What is the limit as x approaches infinity of this rational expression? Wait, why don't we have to do calculus now? You'll see. Okay. Would you agree this is the same thing as the limit as x approaches infinity of x over the square root of x squared times 1 over the square root of 1 plus 2 over x squared. Um, that's a lot of steps. Uh, is x times 1 the yes. original numerator? Yes. Is the square root of x squared times this the original here? Gotcha, yeah. 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 That makes sense. And would you agree then that I can take this overall limit and break it up into two? Yeah. So the limit as x approaches positive infinity of the first piece times the limit of the second piece, yes? Yeah. What does this second piece equal? <coughs> that's zero. Boy. Hmm? I mean, that's under. Well. So x, x gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What does 2 over x squared do? That gets smaller and smaller. Approaches? So zero. Zero? Yeah, so, so one's just 1 over the square root of 1. So that's basically 1. That is 1. Yeah. How about this? That's just x over x. That's just 1. In this case, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. In this case, it's 1. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So overall, I definitely have at least one Horizontal asymptote? Would it be at y equals 1 then? Right, y equals 1. That's one horizontal asymptote. For the other horizontal asymptote, this is where you got to be careful. you got to check the case where x approaches y. Negative infinity too. Right. So I'm going to do the same process. I'm just going to change one thing. And that is the limit. I'm going to stick a negative sign out in front, so negative, negative inf, negative inf. Because the algebra stays the same, yes? Yeah. Okay. So, dealing with this now new case where I'm approaching and going all the way to the left, what does the second piece equal? Approaching to the left? Yes. Oh, it's the same thing, right? Same It'll thing? You one over the square root of one, so just one? Just one? Yeah. Well, it's going to be different on that one. Why? Because... What does the bottom always equal? The bottom's always positive, so, but the top's going to be negative. Right. So that's going to be the negative one. Right. Another way to see that is the graph of x over the square root of x squared. So Remember? if I divided x over x, the square root of x squared first, I would have not gotten the right answer, right? No. You have to do the limit before division? Yes. OK, cool. Because the graph of x over the square root of x squared looks like this. Oh, wow, yeah. That's 1, that's negative 1. So of course, when you go all the way out to the right, it's a positive 1. But when you go all the way out to the left, it's a negative 1. It's a negative 1. Where, of course, we, have, we got a vertical break at 0. So I not only have a, vertical, a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1, I got another one at y equals negative 1. y equals negative 1, absolutely. So I got my asymptotes, I got my intercepts. Now it is time to graph. There we go. We're not done. Uh, first, let's put my intercepts on the board. You can kind of start wherever you want, but let's start with our points. Mm -hmm. Intercepts, points of inflection, relative extrema. Let's just put those on the board. That's what I'm graphing this to? Yeah. Cool. Oh, right. that's the first word. 
We need a graph, but we need a lot of information before we can constru construct yeah. a good graph. So we got a point at the origin. Yes, we do have that. Do we have anything else? Any other points? Um, uh, yeah, I've got some lines somewhere. Um, That's but, not a point. Okay. Uh, any other defined points? I don't see any. No, out of what we're asked for, intercepts and relative extrema, points of inflection. Um, our point of inflection was at the origin itself. Zero, zero. Excellent. Our intercepts were zero, zero. Okay. So that's it for our points. Now let's go for, uh, how about the asymptotes? So we got to use our horizontal barriers at yes. one and negative one. Yeah, do we have any vertical asymptotes? Nope. Nope, we just have horizontal. This one and this one. There's positive one. And there's negative one. So we could have done this um, with pre-com knowledge if we were really careful. But what about concavity? What about concavity? What is this thing doing from zero to negative infinity? So it's concave up on the left side. Yes, it's concave up, but remember it's not a full U, it's a partial U. That flattens out but still decreases on to negative infinity. All right, function decreases, but the slope is increasing left to right. Yeah. But now here, what's it doing from zero to positive infinity? It's being concave. Not the opposite, concave down. Concave down, yes. The U, it's a kind of a big U for one, and the secondly, it's facing down. The mouth of the U is facing down. So that is what the graph of this guy looks like. Is this in keeping with my first derivative? I believe so. First it's derivative? Increasing, yeah. Again, be careful with the word it. The graph is always increasing. Right. The original graph. Right. F is always increasing. F prime is always what kind of number? F prime is always a positive number, yeah. F prime is the slope? Yes. The slope is positive everywhere? Everywhere, yeah. So this matches all of our calculative details. Any questions so far? Okay, so again, it's a lot, but we're really, we're incorporating all of our knowledge of everything we've done so far. Our first derivative knowledge, our second derivative knowledge, even our pre-calculus knowledge. So let us have a stab. One more problem, one more, same, same deal. Graph this, so graph this, find the intercepts, find the asymptotes, Find the relative extrema, classify the relative extrema. Um, points of inflection and intervals of concavity. So I'm gonna start with the big heavy duty calculus concepts first. What is F prime? Let's see. That's 10 over three, X to what power? Uh, two, two over three. Yeah. Minus 20 over three, X to the one third, yes? Yep. And I can factor that. I can pull out a 10 thirds. Yep. I can pull out an x to the 1 third. So as to be left with um, a single x to the 1 third. Yeah. Then minus what? Minus 2. All right. 10 over 3, take it, take that out of 20 over 3. You are left with a 2. Left with a 2. All right, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna put that over here and then ask you the question, when does this equal zero and when does it equal undefined? All right, is this ever undefined? No. I'm never dividing by any variable, so no, it can't be undefined. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd root, so I don't have to worry about negative square roots um, or negative even roots. Okay, so this equals zero. When either x to the one-third is zero, yes? Yes. Or x to the one-third minus two is zero? Yes. Start from the top. If x to the one-third is zero, what does that imply about x? x has to be zero. x has to be zero. This implies that x to the one-third equals two. That happens when x equals eight. x equals eight. 
So 0 and 8 are what kind of numbers? Critical numbers. Critical numbers. They make the derivative either 0 or undefined. First derivative, 0 or undefined. So we got our critical numbers. Let's migrate on over to the second derivative. And uh, let's see. All right, so likewise, similar process. If you want, you can do quote, you can do product rule, or you can follow this out, and then take the next derivative to get the second. Uh, but I'm not going to show you the steps. But I'm just going to say it follows the same pattern. That's my second derivative. Now, when is this thing equal to zero? Um, it's zero when x to the one third is one. So when x is one. All right, x equals one works. Am I done with my possible points of inflection? I think you can find a point where it's undefined as well. Okay, and this is undefined when x is zero. When x is zero, and I should have done this for the last one as well. Does x equaling one and x equaling zero, do those generate defined values for the original? Yeah. All right, I plug one in, I get, uh, Negative three. Mm -hmm. I plug zero and I get zero. Yeah. So in this case, yeah, the, the undefined case does generate a possible point of inflection. Okay. Remember for a previous problem, you know, we said equal undefined, but the x values for which it was undefined were undefined in the original. So they couldn't be a point of inflection if we don't have a point there. Not so with this problem. With this problem, we do have two possible points of inflection there, and we got two uh, possible relative extrema. What do I do with these numbers? Um, we need to set up the boundaries of those and see if the directions change in either from each boundary to another one. Or yeah, or, or put another way, I look at my entire domain. What's the entire domain of this original? That's all real numbers, right? Eh? All real numbers, negative inf to positive inf. And I slice that up using these four numbers. Okay. This has just three because zero and zero are That's the same. Yeah. So, take all this stuff, slice up the entire domain, let us see what we have. Okay then. Negative infinity to zero is the first one? Yep. Are you going to include, like, x? Yes, I'm including the entire domain. <coughs> oh, oh yeah. The entire good. domain is my top row. Gotcha. Then x being zero. Then zero to one. one. Then of course x equaling one. One. Then one to eight. One to eight. That's a sideways. That's eight. a sideways eight. I mean something else. X equaling eight, and finally eight to infinity. Finally eight to infinity. Let's get a giant tic tac toe board. That's what makes it fun. I want to look at what f double prime is doing and what f prime is doing and what plain old f is doing. Like it. Nice. Very nice. Very beautiful. Giant tic tac. -tac. A lot of spaces to fill. A lot of space to gallop. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's take it from the top. F double prime. What is that doing on this interval? Positive or negative? Let's see. Take a negative 10. Okay. Start with the bottom. So let's actually analyze the bottom independently. If I take a number, any number, and square it, what, is, what happens to it? It turns positive. It turns positive. Yeah. If I cube root a positive, that is? Uh, positive. Positive. If I just multiply 9 by a positive, that is? Positive. So the denominator is always positive? Yeah. It's cool. always positive wherever f double prime is defined. I'll say always positive except when x equals zero. Yeah. So we just need to worry about the numerator then? Yes, the numerator. If I take a negative, let's say a negative 10. Yeah. If I cube root that. That'll still be negative. Yeah, so that'll be like negative uh, two or, or yeah, like negative two point something. Negative two point something minus one is what kind of number? Still negative. Still negative? Yeah. It's so a negative times a positive 20. A negative. Negative. Negative divided by a positive. It's a negative. 
is a negative, so that is a minus. Okay. Isn't that fun? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So, so same number, sine of f prime. Okay. Take that thing and uh, toss it on in the first derivative. Cool. In the factored form, that's the easiest form to work with. Negative 10, cube root that. It's a negative. Negative, minus 2. Negative. Negative. And negative times, uh, that's going to be another negative though. Oh, it is, yeah. So that's going to be positive. That is going to be positive. We got a different sign for f prime. Yeah. What do these two things imply? So it's concave down, but it's also increasing. Right. It's concave down, but f is concave down, but f is also increased. Increased. Those follow from those two facts. Now then, at x equals zero, what is f double prime of do f double prime doing? Um, it's not existing. Yeah, it is not existing. Having a happy time, being non-existent, being undefined. And uh, what's f prime doing? That's gonna be zero times whatever. It's gonna be zero. That's a curl over here. Yeah. That's just zero. So we're gonna leave these blank for now. Okay. How about the intervals? Let's see. Zero to one. If I put a half in. So a half of x to the one, but it's gonna be a number less than one. Some decimal. Yeah, so that minus one's gonna be negative. Negative times positive, so it's gotta be negative. Gotta be negative. Gotta be negative. You take a one half and you throw it in the first root, positive or negative. So the parentheses is also going to be negative times a positive outside the parentheses. That's a negative. Yeah. Okay. So that's concave down as well, and that is decreasing. All right. So if we have that information, we can go back to x equals zero and fill in those bullet points, right? Yes. Oh uh, yes, absolutely. Um, x equaling zero which of course corresponds to zero f of zero as the point. Right. Is this point a point of inflection? Well, since it's undefined, well, since it's going from concave down to concave down, it's not a point of inflection. No, there's no change in the sign of the concavity. There's no change in concavity, there's no change in the sign of the second derivative. Mm -hmm. So this is not A P O. Nice. In agreement? Yeah. Cool. But there are two ways of doing this next one. Because we have a first derivative test and a second derivative test. Is zero f of zero uh start from the top? Is it an extrema? A relative extrema? Well it's going from increasing to decreasing, and the first derivative is zero at zero, so that would be a relative extrema. That would be a relative maximum, right? Yes. It's a relative maximum. And by the way, what's the other way we could determine that this was a relative maximum? Um, the fact that it's always concave down and defined at zero. Yep. It's always concave down. So we could have done that either way. Either with this f prime row yeah. or the f double prime row. Cool. But just for the sake of space, I'm going to say that this was a consequence of going from uh, being a positive slope to a negative slope. Likewise, one. If I take one and I throw it in f double prime, what do I get? In f double prime, you get a positive on the denominator, and you get zero. You get, get zero, yeah. Right, that was a possible point of inflection. Yeah. How about if I take one and I throw it in the first derivative? Um, you get negative in the parentheses and positive outside, so that'd be negative. Negative overall. That's decreasing, and it's got it's a possible point of inflection. So I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave that blank. Okay. But here I know it's. Decreasing. It's decreasing at that instant. Yeah. That one point, it is decreasing. Mm -hmm. so we can move on over to the next interval. One to eight, pick a number in there and throw it in the second derivative. Nice. I take five, throw it in there. Positive or negative? It's gonna be a number, x five to the one third is greater than one, so it's gonna be positive times 20. So positive, 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 positive. Positives all around for my second derivative. Nice. Positive, if I take a five and I throw it in here for the first, 
Do I get positive or negative? So five and one third, that's still gonna be less than two, so that's negative. Yeah. Times a positive outside, so that's gonna be negative again. Again, five to the one third, something less than two. Yeah. This, this parenthetical is negative. Negative times a positive times a positive gives you a negative. So, concave up by this first fact. Yeah. F is concave up. F is also decreasing. Decreasing over that entire interval by the second fact. Cool. And so with these facts, we can go back and fill in what. So it's changing concavity. Right. At one F of one. Yeah. At that point, it's gotta be uh, F is changing its concavity. So it's gotta be a point of inflection. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a POI. It's a point of inflection. Last two rows before we are done with this giant tic-tac-toe board. If you throw eight into here, positive or negative? Um, that's gonna be two minus, yeah, it's gonna be positive. Absolutely, that's a positive. Yeah. We are well on our way to filling in what this entire graph is doing. That's so much good information here, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. I take eight and I throw it in my first row. We determined that that was zero. Yeah. So, you know, it's a possible. That's a zero, yeah. Possible extremum. Okay. But I'm going to leave the extremum thing blank for a moment. But well, we know it's concave up, right? We know it's concave up, yes. Final interval. Take a really big number, throw it in your second derivative, positive or negative? It's 6,000 in there. That's going to be positive. That seems pretty positive to me. I think 6,000. The first derivative, that's also going to be positive. Nice. Yes. So this thing is always on this interval concave. But it's increasing finally. This time it's increasing. F is increasing and F is concave up on that interval. And it's concave up on the interval before it. So that must mean that that relative extrema is going to be relative minimum. Relative min, exactly. And you could have done that either with this information here. Yeah. Or this information. Going from being negatively sloped to positively sloped. So either way, either way you crumble the cookie. That is a relative minimum. And by that I mean the point. 8, comma, f of 8. Yes? Yeah. So with that, we are done with our calculus information, I think. Yeah. So we got relative extrema mm -hmm. out of the way. We got points of inflection out of the way. Mm -hmm. We have intervals of concavity out of the way. Yeah. And now we just have two pre-calculus, maybe possibly calculus-ish yeah, things. So with asymptotes? Asymptotes and uh, intercepts. intercepts. Yeah. We don't really need this part here anymore. We just need that chart. Start with the intercepts. I have two erasers on this board. Yeah. Oh well. Blue eraser for blue, we got a eraser for red. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. But the other, other side of the board is looking quite lonely as a result. Gotcha. Alright. To find x intercepts, I said which coordinate equal to zero. You said the whole f of x to zero. Yeah, half of x over y. All right, so y being zero implies zero equals all of this, yes? Yeah. Oh, and if x is just zero, then that one's zero. Yeah, but there might be another one, right? There might be another one, yeah. So let's pull out the, uh, and x to the four thirds. Okay. So I'm left with two times x to the one third minus five. All right. So this works when x equals zero, by way of that. Yeah. But by way of this, x to the one third has to equal five over two. Five over two, which implies so x is one twenty-five over eight. Yeah, you got to cube everything. One twenty-five over eight. It's gonna be about uh, like fifteen-ish. Yeah, fifteen. Fifteen point something. Point something. Yeah. But anyway. Six two five. We got two x-intercepts, one at 0, 0, mm -hmm. and the other one at 125 over 8, yeah. 0. Cool. Finally, y-intercept. Well, 
that's just setting all of x to zero. Yeah, set the x coordinate equal to zero. Yeah, that's just you know, easy as you yeah. go. Uh, zero, zero again, so we just have two intercepts. Mm -hmm. This guy and this guy. Now, how's about asymptotes? Do I have any vertical asymptotes? I don't think, no, it's defined everywhere. Right, yes, yeah, defined ever, so definitely no vertical asymptotes. Um, scan is continuous. Yeah. Um, what about uh, horizontal? Any horizontal? No, don't think so. No, if you go out to positive infinity, it just keeps growing. And growing to positive infinity, right? Usually, if there are no fractions, then you won't have to worry about asymptotes, eh? Why? Not, not necessarily. I mean, you could have fractions and small. Well, in, gen that's, in general, that's that's true, but you might have some weird stuff some for weird which stuff, yeah. for which that's not true. Anyway, I'm done with intercepts. I don't have any asymptotes, right. so I just have to graph using all that stuff. All this stuff. First thing I want to do is I want to put some points on the board. I have my intercepts. That'd be nice. Uh, now let me be a little less lazy. And find what these points here, here, and here are. What is zero f of zero? That's just zero, zero. That's zero, zero. What about one f of one? That's two minus five, so one negative three. One negative three, and finally, what about eight f of eight? Let me do some math. Um, that'd be two times, what, 32 minus Five times six. You got a calculator? Can you use it? Okay. Um, I got negative sixteen. Negative sixteen. Again, we threw it in the original. Yeah. And now we can plot all of those points. Plot the intercepts. Plot the extrema. And plot the points of inflection. Start from the top. Intercepts. I got one at zero zero. Yes. Yes. I got another one way out here at 125 over 8. Over 8. That's greater than 8. That is greater than 8. Yeah. Okay. So, put 8 about right there. Okay. And we need 1 as well. Yeah. Well, that's not, I mean, 8 is close to 15, right? 8 is, yeah, you can move it a little bit to the left, I guess. So, I'll put it right there. 8 and negative 16, so somewhere down there, yes? Yes. So that point's out of the way. Next, I need 1, negative 3. It's about... Right there? About right there, yeah. About right there, so... Check, 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 check. 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 That's it? Yep. Okay, and now I fill in the dots. Fill in the gaps. Fill in the dots. Fill in the gaps using my beautiful, exquisite calculus chart. Nice. Okay, let's start left to right. What is this thing doing? From uh, negative infinity to zero. Well, it's always increasing, but it's always concave down. It's always increasing. But it's always concave down, so right? It's going to like dive down into negative infinity from the left. Yeah. Again, left to right, the slope is always increasing. increasing. F prime is always positive, yes. but F double prime is always negative. negative. So F by itself, okay, we're graphing F, it is concave down. So at x equals zero, are we good? It's, uh, yes. yep, slope is zero. It's not a point of inflection. That's a relative max. What is it doing from zero to one? Let's move on over. So it's, so the original function is decreasing, but it's still gonna maintain the downwards concavity. All right, we, we, yeah, we, yeah, just, we, you can pretty much just use the last row. Yeah. It's concave down and it's decreasing. And then it hits one. change concavity at one, but still be decreasing. Yeah. From one to eight, it is concave. Up. 
Concave up, what do I have at eight? A relative. A relative minimum. Relative min? So I just gotta shoot up after that. Like that? Mm-hmm. What's it doing from eight onwards? It's going to shoot up and hit the x-axis. Right, that's being concave up. That point. That's always increasing as well. Let me see. Into our chart. Into our chart, into uh, uncharted territory. Charted territory in this case. So that's it. That is how you can graph things. Weird things. Things you would not know off the top of your head. Yeah. Using the wealth of knowledge from calculus and pre-calculus in perfect unison, perfect balance, one with the other. So is this the last calculus video ever? Does that make you feel sad? Yeah, a little. A little sad? We know all of Cal 1 now? More or less? More or less. More or less. But Sweet. But I know calculus is like is like life. It's never over. Depending on your perspective. <laughs> Fine. Fine. Uh that's it? We're done? That's it. Okay.